Dan, you want to kick us off? Yes, I would like to okay. thank everybody for participating today. Uh, thanks to Vicki. She has helped me install a microphone so I can actually talk to everybody and make it work. Without her help, I would still be struggling. Uh, I thought we had a, and thanks to Rodney and the staff for a wonderful kickoff the last go round. I've already had uh, conversations with two researchers at Auburn involving a potential new frac fluid, a greener frac, a little bit frac fluid, as well as a method for reducing some methane emissions in certain areas of the Marcella Shale. Uh, so I look forward to hearing more uh, about that. Uh, Larry and Crowd and Rodney, thank you a lot for setting this up. And I don't really know much about this uh, uh, nanotechnology, so I'm excited to hear uh, what Dr. Davis has to tell us. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Stan. This is Larry Filmer, and I'd like to welcome everyone uh, to the uh, webinar uh, as well today. Uh, let me go over just a couple of housekeeping things. Um, if, during the presentation, if you'll hold your questions until the end of the presentation, uh, we would prefer that. Uh, however, you can uh, type in a question during the presentation, and uh, Vicki will moderate those um, uh, questions at the end of uh, Dr. Davis's presentation. Um, we also are recording the webinar, and it will be available and archived so that uh, if you wish to see it again, or there are others that were not able to join us today, they'll be able to, um, to see it as well. Um, so uh, let me uh, welcome Dr. Davis and just introduce uh, Dr. Davis. Uh, she's our guest today. She is an associate professor in the chemical engineering department in the College of Engineering at Auburn. Dr. Davis's research is primarily focused on processing nanomaterials into larger functional materials. She has won numerous national awards, including the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers in 2010. She currently serves as the Secretary Treasurer of the American Society of Chemical Engineers Nanoscale Science and Engineering for Forum. Uh, Dr. Davis earned her PhD from Rice uh, University in 2006, and her career has also included work with Shell Chemicals uh, polymer business in the U.S. and Europe. Dr. Davis, thank you very much for being our guest on the webinar today, and uh, I'll turn it over to you, and thanks again for joining us. Great. Thank you very much. I appreciate uh, the invitation to talk to everyone today and, and the coordination that it took. Uh, I think this is an exciting new initiative uh, to do webinars featuring uh, various Auburn University research strengths. Um, today I'm going to talk about a, a fairly broad topic, nanotechnology, bio, nano, and polymer research. Any one of these uh, could be an hour-long talk. I'm going to try and keep it uh, much more limited so we have time for questions. So I'm going to kind of gloss over the surface, but I would be you know, happy to respond uh, to emails later if we can't get to all the questions at the end or if other things uh, come up from people who listen to the recording. So before we start talking about nanotechnology, I, I want to just give everybody a frame of reference for what we mean when we say nano. Uh, the term is in the popular literature and um, TV shows and cartoons and uh, even the Chevy Corvette that just got relaunched now. So I, pe most people have heard the term, but just to kind of, you know, get everybody thinking about what it means, you know, an ant that we're all familiar with, they're about a millimeter, 10 to the minus 3 meters. A micron is about the size of a bacteria, or 10 to the minus 6 meters. And a nanometer is 10 to the minus 9 meters, and that's the size of one single sugar molecule. Not one crystal, not you know the heaping tablespoon I sometimes dump in my coffee, but just one little bitty tiny sugar molecule, one nanometer in size. So, so why why should we talk about nanotechnology? And the reason we should talk about nanotechnology is jobs, economic development, and trying to solve engineering grand challenges and everyday mundane applications as well. Uh, nanotechnology is predicted to rival the development of the automobile and the introduction of the personal computer. That's a pretty big statement, then uh, there's quite a number of people out there who have seconded that statement in various forms. In 2006, global nano-enabled products were $60 billion. In 2007, that was up to $147 billion. The 2015 projection is $3.1 trillion, or 15% of total global manufactured goods, which means it's something that we should be aware of both as consumers 
and people uh, doing research, people in industry, people in government, is something we should all be aware of. So another way to kind of give you a frame of reference on uh, how small is nano, one of the uh, probably earlier adoptions of uh, synthetic and intentional nanotechnology was in paints and coatings. Uh, that's been going on since the 90s. And if we take the Spare Premium Plus Ultra Paint, which is especially washable and all these other things because and low volatile organic compounds, because of the nanomaterials in it, we say, OK, well, this gallon will normally cover uh, 250 to 400 square feet. I want you to think for just a second about how big an area you think you could cover with one gallon of paint if you could somehow apply it only a nanometer thick to a flat surface. And when I, when I do this in live uh, seminars, I get a whole range of answers from the audience. But I'll go on and show you in this format. It's roughly the size of the main Auburn University campus and a little bit beyond, about 1.5 square miles. So if you think about it, the next time you're repainting a room or something, the average thickness of the wall paint that you apply, even when you're trying to make that gallon go pretty far, is about 100,000 times thicker than a nanometer. Now, nanotechnology, uh, there's formal definitions, uh, there's informal definitions. The one that I use the most, which is a slight adaptation of the National uh, Nanotechnology Initiative except the definition, is simply the study and use of materials with one dimension less than 100 nanometers. Now, nanotechnology is something we think about as being new, but that's not really true. If you've been to uh, Europe or other places where they have old cathedrals, those stained glass windows were enabled by nanotechnology. Now, the medieval artisans didn't know they were using nanogold and nanosilver, but because of the elements they used and the way they prepared the glass, they were actually making nanomaterials. And in fact, one of the cool things about nano is that you can actually tell what's going on at the bulk scale, particularly when it comes to optical properties. So nano gold, as we all think of it, is at, nano gold is actually red, not the yellow that we think of. Nano silver is not silver; it's actually um, gold colored. And in fact, you can have a whole range of colors from both gold and silver by making different materials. Now, this is very important in a number of optical applications as well as medical imaging applications. We've recently discovered that the Damascus swords were so sharp and strong and reliable because they contain carbon nanotubes. Now, there's many places in literature where you'll see that carbon nanotubes weren't discovered until 1991. We didn't know they were there, but ancient steel makers knew how to create them. Similarly, the gecko, the reason it can climb walls is because of the small hairs on its feet there are nanosized that create a very large attractive force that enable it to climb walls. And there's a number of researchers looking at mimicking this in synthetic materials. Uh, in modern nanotechnology, we have a number of different things. A lot of the initial applications have been sporting goods, uh, lightweight bicycles for races such as Tour de France, uh, baseball bats, tennis balls that keep their bounce longer, uh, skin care products. If you think about the old uh, beach movies, there was always the white stripe on the nose. Now we have clear uh, sunscreens, clear deodorants. And that's because the same old titanium oxide and zinc oxide materials are now nano-sized. Similarly, we can have flexible solar panels for nanotechnology. There's lots of nanotechnology going on in cars. Uh, Toyota first commercialized a car carbon uh, nano clay nylon fan housing back in 1991. Now almost all our automobiles have nanomaterials in their coatings for scratch resistance, uh, nanomaterials in their bumpers, truck bed liners, various components on the cars all have nanotechnology in them. And then another sporting good, uh, hockey sticks, racing boats, all kinds of things. So in the 20th century, it was said that the future is plastic from the graduate. Or if you want to think uh, further back to It's a Wonderful Life, they were talking about polymers then. And now we can't look around a room without seeing a polymer that was made. Uh, and in fact, we ourselves are natural polymers. In the 21st century, the future is nanotechnology. But the key here is that wonderful things don't just happen. We didn't get all these polymer applications, both for healthcare and medicine and clothing and walls and structural materials. They had to be engineered. 
So when I worked in the polymer industry for Shell, we made a lot of good plastic resin. There were always people looking at new applications for this plastic. But a plastic pellet is just a plastic pellet. Similarly, a carbon nanotube is just a carbon nanotube. It may have, at the molecular level, at the individual carbon nanotube level, the highest strength known, amazing thermal conductivity, amazing electrical conductivity, and all these things. But it's not very useful unless you can figure out what to do with it. So attaining performance properties in real systems and materials requires selecting the right nanomaterial for the application and then optimizing the processing to go with that nanomaterial. And some of you may be aware that of studies that uh, a nanomaterial has failed to show as much strength enhancement or conductivity enhancement as was hoped for. That was probably because it wasn't properly dispersed. If a nanomaterial isn't dispersed down to its nano constituents, it's not nano. If I wanted to take uh, aggregates of carbon nanotubes and put them in a polymer, I may as well just go get soot from my barbecue grill, and I would probably get the same properties. The key is that the nanomaterial has to be dispersed at the nano level for its properties to be manifested. So a lot of what my research group does is look at this dispersion challenge. All the things you were taught in chemistry class about weak van der Waals forces and scaling of attractive forces, at the nanoscale, those things you were told were trivial are actually really important. So overcoming attractive forces between nanoparticles is a huge part of nanotechnology research. And in my group, we use classical colloidal science principles to control alignment and flocculation, what kind of structures we get to break those aggregates apart. We apply chemistry principles to keep them apart and improve compatibility with any surrounding materials. And we apply chemical engineering or materials engineering principles to look at how chemistry and processing interact and to ensure scalability. And in my group, we are particularly concerned about not doing processing that isn't scalable and not doing processing that will damage the intrinsic properties of the nanomaterial itself. You can liken this to the uh, classical office max rubber band ball. This could be, uh, although nanomaterials are actually very rigid, they can entangle into large aggregates. So we like to take those aggregates apart and put them back together the way we want them. Or you could think about it in terms of Lego bricks. When you get a box of Legos, even if it's supposed to make the coolest new Lego uh, thing, like a Death Star, the Millennium Falcon, or whatever, it's probably packaged with you know, similar blocks stuck together in a very boring way. To make something cool, you've got to take those blocks apart and put them back together where you, you want them. And that's what we do in my research group. So to make nano-enabled functional materials, we really look at taking those blocks apart and doing macro scale assembly to achieve desired performance properties. And in my group, we look at fluid phase processing. We look at things where things are in a polymer uh, or melt or liquid. And for that reason, we look at uh, the structure of the nanomaterial itself and the microstructure of the system. We look at how that structure changes with processing and how all those interact to give you properties. And because we're doing things in a fluid form, Rheology actually gives us the best bulk assessment of what's going on. And rheology, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, is simply the study of how things flow. Now, there's a few things that I want to touch on today uh, just to kind of highlight some of the potential uh, for, for nano and nanobio, and a lot of those relate to polymers. Uh, the first thing is high strength lightweight materials. High strength lightweight materials are important for a number of reasons particularly energy conservation. If you, it's been shown that approximately 75% of vehicle fuel consumption is related to mass. Now, of course, that's going to vary for the type of vehicle, but that mass can come from the structure of the body. That mass can come from how the significant number of feet of wiring you have in an airplane or anything else. So if you can lightweight a materi uh, material of vehicles, especially for aerospace and automotive and mass transit, you can have significant energy savings. So polymer nanocomposites, or adding nanomaterials to polymers, is one way to do that. It can also give you some additional properties, such as electromagnetic interference, shielding, enhanced flame retardancy, thermal conductivity, uh, thermal stability, and electrical conductivity, depending on what materials you're using. Uh, I think Richard Baya put the goal of polymer nanocomposite research very well 
a number of years ago when he said that the goal of polymer nanocomposite research was simply to make polymers do what they cannot. Uh, again, that first large-scale commercial application was way back in 1991, way before most of us were even talking about nano. Um, so it is doable. But the key ongoing challenges are controlling and quantifying the dispersion state and tailoring the interface between the nanomaterial and the polymer. And that's true no matter what kind of nanomaterial you're, you're using, whether it's a nanoparticle, a carbon nanotube, an inorganic nanowire, or whatever. Now, single-walled carbon nanotubes, shown here, are probably the most notorious. Because trying to break up this bundle that comes out of this reactor takes several orders of magnitude more than thermal energy. So you have to do it using thermodynamics, a subject that some, most of you probably recall from school. Um, and each one of these little circles here is a one nanometer diameter nanotube. But these aggregates can actually be millimeters or centimeters in size, in which case they're not going to enhance mechanical strength. They're actually just going to create stress risers and deteriorate mechanical strength. So my research is on controlling and quantifying the dispersion state and tailoring the interface between the nanomaterial and the polymer to enable load transfer. And I'm looking at carbon nanotubes uh, and thermoplastics, carbon nanotubes and thermosets, and impregnation of bucky papers, which are simply carbon nanotube nonwoven. I also work with other nanomaterials that I'll talk about later, including silver nanowires, cellulose nanocrystals, silica nanorods, and um, various other materials. So when we make a deposit, the properties are controlled by the intrinsic properties of those components. Okay, carbon nanotubes are about 100 times stronger than steel. That one-sixth the weight. That sounds great. But we're not going to build a bridge or make a car out of a single nanotube. We need to get those amazing properties ported to a real system. So we have the intrinsic properties that affect things. Then we have all our processing variables, especially that dispersion state, or if we're thinking about an epoxy system or another thermoset system, curing and cross-linking. And then we have the interface, which is surface chemistry and thermodynamics. And again, the nanotube, at the nanoscale, surface chemistry is huge. For example, for a single wall carbon nanotube, it's 1,300 meters squared per gram. But again, they want to aggregate, to, so to access that, you have to overcome a huge pairwise interaction between them. And there's a number of ways to do that. Uh, one of them is debundling and functionalization. My PhD research with Rick Smalley at Rice was on using protonation with super acids. And that is a great method. It's very similar to what's done for processing well-known materials such as Kevlar. But it's not compatible with resins or a lot of other materials. A lot of people basically use sonication uh, high-powered versions of uh, jewelry and silverware cleaners that consumers buy to shake things up and break them apart. But that can cause damage that destroy the properties that you want. So we look at actually changing the chemistry of the system through polymerization schemes, uh, through absorbing other materials on it, and changing the degree of functionalization. So for one example, some of our research lately has been on unsaturated polyester resin. Now, you guys are probably more familiar with work on epoxy, but UPR, or unsaturated polyester resin, actually has twice the domestic market share as epoxy, and it's 80% of the worldwide thermoset resins. So if we don't look at how we can enhance its intrinsic properties with nanomaterials, we're missing a huge opportunity. But there hasn't been as much research on it as there has been for epoxy. Now, what we looked at uh, was doing all these different surface chemistries to see how it would interact either with the main component of the resin or the volatile styrene component of the resin. And through that, we've enabled better dispersion states, and we believe that's going to translate to better properties. This is very recent uh, ongoing research. Uh, so, so far, what we've done is compared the effects of functionalization schemes on dispersion and the interface for single-walled carbon nanotubes or SWINT, and their kind of nested analog multi-walled carbon nanotubes or WINT, and we've also done some collaborative work on graphene. Now we're looking at how these chemistries affect our curing process. Because obviously for a thermoset resin, the way we cross-link and cure it is also going to be very critical to properties. And then we'll use design of experiments to determine the combined effects of the structure, that's materials, functionalization, dispersion state, and processing on curing conditions. 
This approach is well known to the polymer industry. It's the same approach that enabled uh, polyethylene terephthalate, which is the resin used in your water bottles and soft drink bottles, to go from its discovery in 19, the 1940s to mylar films to leisure suits in the early 70s to barrier packaging for juices and small size soft drink bottles in the 2000s. If you think about it, it actually took from the 40s until the early 90s to make a soft drink bottle that would hold carbonation and stand up by itself. So none of these things are going to happen very quickly. It's been said that one of the key things about materials development is that if you get it right, you have a 100-year product or a 100-year company. But it's going to take a couple decades to really get everywhere you can go. We still use materials that were invented many decades ago. This is very different than the computer industry, where everything's going to turn over 18 months, and everything's going to be out of date every 18 months. So it takes longer to do the development, but if you look at the profitability uh, under the curve, it's actually, by some consulting uh, studies, more profitable to look at these longer-term materials development. And I've included a couple of uh, very recent journal articles in this. Again, this is very uh, ongoing work that's at a fairly early stage. Uh, some of our previous work that we were able to take all the way through the process was on polypropylene. Polypropylene is a thermoplastic resin. Uh, it's one of the most commonly used resins out there. It's used in everything from carpet fiber to baby diapers to lunch boxes to cups and a huge host of other things. And what we did was we looked at how the materials we use, functionalized carbon nanotubes here with the C12 dodecyl group, vapor grown carbon fiber, much cheaper, much more perfect analog, much larger analog as well, and plain single wall carbon nanotubes interacted with the recirculation time in this little baby extruder, uh, screw speed, and extrusion temperature. And I want to note that you know I am a university researcher now, so we do do things here, typically at very small scale. But this little baby extruder that only has five grams can give us good results that we can have looked at scaling up to a larger machine here in the polymer and fiber engineering department. And because of my past experience working with machines that were spitting out 23,500 pounds an hour, I have a pretty good idea of how things can potentially scale up using this sort of process. So here what we found was that if we looked at the thermal decomposition temperature, or the temperature at which the material would start decomposing, uh, the material had the biggest role in the process, but also the recirculation time, which affected both mixing and polymer degradation. And there were also some interaction terms. That so was both temperature and the material had an interaction. And we can see developed models using design of experiments, predictive models, where we can get an equation that will give us a predicted uh, thermal decomposition temperature versus experimental values so that we don't need to test every single point. Another approach for high strength, lightweight materials is advanced manufacturing. That's another word you've probably heard a lot about. Now, the new manufacturing initiatives that have been announced by the Obama administration, particularly the National um, Advanced Manufacturing Institute and National Manufacturing Initiative, as well as several others, have a lot of opportunities to bring manufacturing back to the U.S. And parallel to that, because of various uh, economic benefits in the supply chain, we're seeing a lot of traditional materials and manufacturing come back to the U.S., particularly in the polymers industry. So 3D printing, selective laser centering, stereolithography, and all the other so-called advanced or digital manufacturing techniques have excellent opportunities for making shapes without having excess materials. So that's one way lightweight, is you take out the parts you don't need. And there is significant opportunity there for tailoring the polymer properties to maximize productivity and performance. Much of the work that's been done so far has been to take existing resins and grade and use those in these new processes. And that'll work for a while. But to really get the most benefit, we need to tailor our polymers to these new processes. This is very analogous to what went on in the 90s and the 2000s in industry, uh, such as the polymer industry I was in, where we needed to, to 
come up with polymers that had controlled crystallization rates and glass transition temperatures for the newer, higher speed injection molding and reheat flow molding processes for soft drink bottles and other packaging applications. Now, for nanocomposites, so we could have a nanocomposite to give you high strength in that more open, um, less wasteful structure, looking at the dispersion stability and low shear aggregation behaviors will be very critical. Uh, this is often overlooked, and rheology is a very powerful tool to assess this. Going back to uh, the NANSTube UPR work that I mentioned earlier, we were actually able to look at several batches of supposedly the same material, single wall carbon nanotubes, uh, made by a similar process. And we looked at viscosity or the resistance to flow versus time. And what we found was that for some of these batches, the viscosity would jump up after a long time. And that corresponded to the formation of aggregates that we could actually see with our eyes. Now, obviously, this is not going to make a cohesive structure. Whereas other batches, we didn't see this behavior, and that gave us a very uniform structure and a much better final resin. And we were able to correlate this to a more time-consuming and higher-tech uh, method called X-ray fed electron spectroscopy, which is great. It was, came down to just a little bit difference in the oxygen content from the purification scheme that was used. So we can use rheology, which is in line in many manufacturing plants, to look at these behaviors and develop better resins for these advanced manufacturing processes. Now, another way to do advanced manufacturing is to do a new twist on very old established processes. Now, here in Alabama, we have a lot of paper mills uh, all over the southeast, a lot of paper machines. It's a process familiar to many people. Now, Dr. Bruce Chatterchuk here in the chemical engineering department a number of years ago adapted a machine to start doing microfibrous materials. More recently, we've collaborated and are looking at extending that to the nanoscale to get a broader range of potential applications and properties. And this is uh, what you're seeing here is a combination of cellulose and that vapor-grown carbon fiber, which I mentioned earlier, which is a nano material that's dispersed and then put on our continuous pilot line paper machine. We actually uh, made several hundred square feet of material using this machine. And you can see the materials with the nanomaterials are black. The ones with just the glass fibers are white. And this SDM shows that we can make a hierarchical material by using different systems of uh, different size scales, the glass fibers, the cellulose, which could be burnt out to open up porosity, uh, and the um, carbon nanot vapor grown carbon nanofibers. And we can extend that to other nanomaterials as well for a range of electrochemical, thermal, catalysis, and structural applications. Now, I realize I'm going very fast and covering a lot of ground. I'm looking forward to some questions at the end. I can't actually see the question box right now. But the, I want to jump over to the nanobio interface. Uh, Angela Belcher coined the term nature's toolbox quite a number of years ago. And it really provides tremendous opportunities for modern uh, engineering. And it can, na using nature's toolbox can be using natural materials for engineering applications, mimicking natural materials to engineer desired properties, or a combination of the two. So nature has always been a nanotechnologist. These abalone seashells are very strong uh, because they have nanoplatelets of calcium carbonate stacked together in a brick and mortar structure that makes them very strong. This luminescence is also from, I mean, iridescence is also from their nanoscale structure. This is e chemically, essentially, the same material as chalk or tums or other very friable structures, but that nanoscale structure ordering in the abalone makes it very strong. The blue morpho butterfly is not actually blue. Its color is due to nanostructural features that interact with light and cause you to see the blue color. Similarly, scarabs and a number of other beetles have uh, different colors and iridescent properties because of the nanoscale structure of chitin and other molecules in their system. So nature has always been an technologist. Now, what we've been looking at here is, again, using predominantly uh, carbon nanotubes, but not exclusively, we've looked at a number of applications where we take fundamental knowledge, combine it with cylindrical nanomaterials, a little bit of biology knowledge, and create successful engineering applications. 
Some of what we've looked at are high-strength antibacterial films and fibers. By combining these nanotubes with an enzyme found in egg white that's known to be antibacterial, this enzyme is also found in biotin mouthwash. Uh, carbon nanotubes and organophosphate hydrolase for organophosphate sensors. Organophosphates are both nerve agents and used in pesticides. So these sensors can be very important on the uh, non-defense side and non-homeland security side. We know more and more about how these organophosphates are affecting young children and fetuses. So being able to detect which ones are in use and differentiate between them and detect levels is increasingly important for avoiding things like attention deficit syndrome. We've looked at using them for biofuel cells and for making optical film components and other fibers with DNA. So here we combine the high strength and our conductivity of the nanocylinders with the structure and function of DNA and enzymes to enable new applications. Another material that we've been using is cellulose nanocrystals. Now cellulose nanocrystals are found in all your plants. They can be extra readily extracted. They'll be a byproduct of the biorefinery processes that many of us are working on. And we're looking at using them for MEMS, our microelectromechanical system. And this is interesting because the MEMS market is supposed to grow very steadily over the next few years. And this includes sensors for airbags, your Wii controllers, your, your cell phone orientation, your printers, your tires, etc. But it relies on silicon, which can be very difficult to process in terms of environmental uh, conditions. It's a not in as natural abundance as cellulose, and the processing can be expensive. So we're looking at can we use cellulose nanocrystals, particularly for biomims, which tends to be one-time use point-of-care diagnostics. And this biomims is supposed to grow extremely significantly over the years. So we're looking at using a byproduct in biorefining, something that's found in all our plants to, and can also be generated by bacteria, to develop an inexpensive replacement for using silicon in these biomims. And this would be particularly uh, good for low-cost testing and third world countries. We also are looking at uh, applic materials for other devices where we use a combination of our nanocylinder, liquid crystal, and self-assembly and shear alignment. Uh, this is, again, using ideas that go back to 1888 and really were solidified during the advent of broad-like polymers such as Kevlar. And we found that with these nanomaterials, we can get controlled optical properties for reflective polarizers, color filters, and light recycling applications. Now, light recycling is particularly important for displays. Most of your um, LCD displays, the energy you put in, a lot of that light that's generated gets lost. In fact, only about 20% of the light gets through because most of the filters and polarizing elements are absorbed if not by reflected. By reflecting that back, the light can recombine and be used more efficiently. So this would uh, result in more energy efficient displays. Uh, we also are looking at uh, thermal interface materials and other applications where we can do uh, printing of wires. We can line nanowires to get larger structures for electrical conductivity or thermal conductivity. And we've looked at a number of systems, including silver, germanium, silica, the cellulose nanocrystals and the carbon nanotubes as well. So this was a very quick rundown of the potential for nanotechnology research in general to translate to real world applications. You probably all have uh, nanotechnology in your homes and nanotechnology in your products. Uh, and I just want to stress that nanomaterials have a long history that predates modern nanotechnology. And these materials have amazing properties, many of them. And as a result, we believe they can help solve many engineering challenges, including lightweight, high-strength materials, sensors, energy applications, and many help with many of the other engineering grand challenges. And the advanced manufacturing methods also have many promising applications. But neither one alone is really going to get us where we want to go. So we need to really look at considering both materials and processing together. And that's the unique capability that we have here in Auburn's College of Engineering. So I'd like to acknowledge my research group. I've shown two pictures because I've had a lot of graduations uh, recently. My PKS award, my Presidential Early Career Award uh, that was mentioned earlier, uh, several NSF grants, the Department of Defense, and the Department of Education for the information that I showed here 
again, I'd be happy to follow up with questions or, or paper, but I'll take any questions uh, from the audience at this time. I think, Vicki, you're going to read them? or Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, the first question we have is from Walt Waltos, and he says, if nanotubes could be aligned in the same direction, would light pass easily through the material? Yes, that's possible. Okay. Um, in fact, uh, Ray Bogman at UT Dallas has done some very interesting work on aligned uh, forests where he makes very clear uh, films of carbon nanotubes by aligning them. He works in the solid uh, phase material. I tend to turn things in the liquid phase where you also, if you, if you line them properly and make a thin film, you can see through them very well. Uh, what I've shown here in this image uh, that's on the screen is a liquid crystal of carbon nanotubes and DNA under cross-polarized light. That fluid and the resulting film under ambient light are very clear, except that because the nanotubes are aligned, they are actually a polarizing filter. So if I put them, uh, you know, if I cross the two films together, depending on how they're rotated relative to each other, it'll either go bright or dark, just like if you take two halves of your polarizing sunglasses out, you can either see through them or get them completely uh, dark. Okay, well, he also follows up that question with, with, will this lead to transparent aluminum a la Star Trek? That's, that's an interesting one. <laughs> um, so I am not as familiar with the potential for tailoring uh, metal structures, et cetera. I think that it can certainly lead to fairly transparent metals. There are some interesting things going on with cloaking. Um, I think that some of the Star Trek stuff probably will come to pass, but I also have to say that if I were living back in the Renaissance when people were imagining airplanes, I would have said no way. So I, I tend to be fairly conservative, but you know some of the changes we've already seen in the last 10 years, uh, not just through nanotechnology, have given us products that we couldn't, have, most of us could not have imagined. Okay. Um, we also have a question from Walt. Lots of sports mentioned by you, but what about golf? What about golf? Yes. Uh, there is actually a lot of nanotechnology in golf clubs and golf balls. Um, there is uh, also fishing rods for the same reason. Mm -hmm. So using uh, nanomaterials in poltrusion to create the shaft uh, can give you uh, different weights, different balances. And I'm not a golfer. My attempts to learn golf failed miserably mm -hmm. when I was in marketing. Um, Maybe that's why I went back to become a professor. I don't know. My golf game never got up to snuff. But uh, I am told that it actually does give you uh, more control drive and direction and give you better control over the ball. So those are on the market. You can find them on uh, Google or whatever. Okay, great. Do we have any more questions from anyone? If you'd like to ask a question, you can either enter it in the question panel or you can uh, click to raise your hand, and I will unmute you. Let's see here. All right, Santa unmuted you. Go ahead. You can ask your question. Okay, uh, uh, Dr. Davis. Some some years ago, we had a a, a bentonite company, and we did a lot of work with American Colloid, and they have one mine in Alabama that's a calcium bentonite, and we had sodium bentonite in Texas. But the interesting part was they were working on a nanoparticle to put in plastic for bottles for the beer industry that would have provide a similar shelf life to a glass bottle. And the advantage, of course, was dramatically less freight cost in, in shipping the product, but equal shelf life to a, a glass bottle. Um, I don't know if we've ever, you, Auburn, has ever talked with American Colloid, but uh, might be somebody to put on your list. They, they may very well be looking for some additional research. I, I, um, and I have not made contact with American Colloid. During my industrial career, I was actually global marketing manager for high barrier packaging, which mostly meant beer because it was the best margins to be had and also the most technically challenging. I was actually uh, 
commercializing a competitive approach, uh, which involves using uh, different resin as well as uh, nano iron for oxygen scavenging. So that uh, I think that we will see similar things to that, and there's a number of different uh, clays and applications and polymers that have been out there, but certainly for things like um, chemical barrier for fuel tanks and other things, and possibly also for our catch-up bottles, uh, we'll see some of these nano clay applications coming forward for barrier applications. It, it keeps coming up and then going away. In the U.S., however, for the beer market, for a variety of uh, reasons, the plastic beer packaging did not take off, and it's now being replaced by the shaped can. So we see it in specialty arenas, but a number of people were very disappointed in the market growth. In contrast, we expected Europe to be the hard market to break into, but uh, Europe actually was much more aggressive in uh, doing uh, plastic packaging for beer applications. And then there's a number of other countries. Uh, the technology I worked on was commercialized in 19 countries. And the uh, technology you mentioned was commercialized in a number of others. So there's a lot of countries out there that are doing the beer packaging very successfully. But for some reason, it did not take off in the US. And I guess my second question, that uh, the, the committee and the participants in this call, what can we do to help you and Auburn University open doors or the particular areas that, that you would very much like to find some additional participants for your research? I think that developing um, relationships with the, for me, the resin suppliers and the people doing these advanced manufacturing schemes, because I think that we have a lot to offer. We have a lot of mid-scale processing equipment that a lot of universities don't have. But not all those companies are aware of us. And, and you know, there's always things about facilitating um, secrecy agreements and all that. And then, of course, the things that you're already doing, such as this webinar, such as the uh, poster sessions and other meetings we've had with various agencies uh, over the last couple of years, that's also very helpful. So I think really just you know, continuing to you know, build awareness and then facilitate connections. All right, we have another question from Walt Maltes. Is there a concern for eventual degradation of nanomaterials from the standpoint of environmental health? Uh, for example, inhalation exposure. There are concerns. Um, I think that one of the best things that nanotechnology has done is raise awareness and start looking at health, safety, and environmental early in the process. And in fact, uh, what we've seen with the, concern, the inhalation concerns that have been raised with carbon nanotubes in particular is that it's led to really developing better standards for reducing exposure to microfine particles. So particles that we know cause similar uh, adverse inhalation responses but weren't, uh, you know, always considered things that you need precautions against. Now, if you read the MSDS for silicon dioxide sand, it's going to tell you that's a carcinogen. Uh, if you get enough of any particle in your lungs, it's going to be a problem. There was a lot of concern about carbon nanotubes early on because the studies involved direct injection of large amounts of nanotubes into rats. Uh, subsequent studies showed that, yes, you can inject almost anything in that quantity directly, and it will be a problem. Uh, now we understand better about how size scales have an effect, as well as shape, as well as chemistry. And there's a lot of people very aggressively working to understand what's going to happen. But we also know now that every time you light a candle, every time you light your barbecue grill, you're making some carbon nanotubes. Not enough to uh, get rich off of or, or make a business out of, but they're there. So although we're concerned about higher levels, they are something that's always been in the environment. All right. And once they're stabilized in golf clubs, everyone agrees they're fine. The main concern is, is worker exposure during fabrication, as it is for almost any chemical and, and additive. All right. Thank you. All right, are there any more questions? 
I'm going to turn it back over to Larry Filmer to wrap us up. Well, Dr. Davis, I just want to say thank you very, very much for taking time uh, out of your schedule today to uh, uh, talk to our research advisory board and others that are on the webinar. I think it's been uh, uh, most productive for all of us who uh, have heard uh, a lot about nanotechnology uh, but don't know much about it. And uh, certainly you have uh, enlightened us with uh, your presentation today. So we are very, very appreciative that you've taken the time uh, to do that. And uh, hopefully as a result of, of the webinar and, and uh, opportunity for the folks to think about uh, some of the subjects that you've talked about, uh, possibly will stimulate some other uh, connections that we will uh, follow up with. So. I just want to thank you and thank everyone who uh, joined the webinar today. Again, it will be uh, uh, archived and, and posted so that you will be able to uh, retrieve it at a later date, and we'll get that information out to you as well. Um, or Vicki, can you uh, identify? Uh, it, it's it's on the earlier um, the slide. Uh, slide, right? It's it's you yeah. can go to the. Um, the Auburn University research uh, button on the, the front page of the university uh, page and go to the research advisory board uh, right. connection and it'll be there. Exactly. exactly. Thank you all very much for your time and, and again for inviting me to speak and, and for your attention and your questions. Well, thank you. Again, we appreciate uh, your time, Dr. Davis. And thank everyone for joining us this afternoon. Have a good day. Thank you.